this week more news on the 2024 iPad unfolds. Will the Nothing Phone 2 reach the US? And Google Chrome could see a minor redesign. All that and more here on Stern's Tech Talk. That's right, we're back for another session of interesting tech news this week. Uh, we are really excited about this one, and we'll go ahead and get started off with a recap on the NFL. And actually, Riley was right on par for last week's prediction. Um, he had it down that Philadelphia was the obvious winner uh, between that matchup against the 49ers, and then he also picked that the KC-Cincy game would be really close, and it was. Um, I won't get into the controversy regarding that, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. I was wrong since he did not win, and Philadelphia definitely blew out Niners. So uh, he had it right down to the spec. Uh, we're going to do a prediction for the Super Bowl, obviously, but we're also going to do a tiebreaker where we actually have to pick the score. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so it's Eagles. Do you have one of mine? You're, you're going to pick oh, Eagles? Oh, I'm picking Eagles because I'm pretty sure you're picking okay. Eagles. I mean... Well, that's not oh, the reason why I'm yeah, picking I have, him, but I have to pick Eagles because, oh, of yeah. course. All right, um, but for the score, that's a that's a tough one because I imagine it will. I don't say it'd be a close game, but I'd say it'd be a hard stop. Like, I'd say Eagles take a six seven point lead, maybe a five point lead, probably depending on how things go. Um, yeah, I don't think it's gonna be too close, but I'll say they'll be. Close enough where there's maybe a touchdown um, offset or something like that. So I actually think that Philadelphia is going to win 38 to 25. I think that'll probably be the score. Wow, that far out huh? there, but I think so. I think um, I think that defense is really showing up, and with all those injuries, with uh, Jones, uh, was it not Jones? No, it's um, Tony. I think his name is Tony. So I think he's a wide receiver. Oh. Then you have Kelsey's out, or not out, but he's not doing so great. Mahomes is having issues with his ankle. That offense is just really banged up, and I don't really think that they're going to be able to recap in two weeks to actually be the premier Chiefs that we've kind of seen over the past few years, actually. So it'll be interesting to kind of, uh, yeah. Um, I'll say then, in if because I, I didn't, I misunderstood you before, so I, I'm I, I, I sorry. No, okay. uh, I'm sorry. Um, I sorry. I sorry. Okay, Prosser. <laughs> I saw we, uh, no, I'll do, um, 28-21. Okay. So you're, you're thinking there's going to be no field goals. All right. Or I guess there could, could be, a, could I mean, there be, could be two field goals and then. you have to have a two-point conversion. Yeah. All right. Well, that'll be cool. We'll, we'll definitely come back to that one actually in two weeks. So, um, and we have some other, uh, corresponding topics related to that. So. With that said, we'll actually move into one quick note before I go into a follow-up topic for last week. And I just wanted to let you guys know that if you are trying to do some trade-ins somewhere down the road with Apple, they have once again reduced trade-in values on iPhones. So Mm -hmm. uh, we'll obviously post that link in in the description below to let, let you guys know kind of what that looks like. The Macs have increased in value uh, by a little bit, but uh, we just kind of want to make you guys aware of that just in case you guys do do trade-ins with Apple. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, that does not affect carrier trade-ins, no. so they're they're normally pretty uh They're on a whole reasonable. other level anyway, so. <laughs> yes, they are. That's, that's for sure. Um, but we'll move on to that uh, follow-up topic from last week, and we actually briefly covered the rebirth of Apple's HomePod. Uh, However, we did pass over one important thing to note, and that was a key feature that the existing HomePod Mini received uh, via HomePod OS 16.3 update. And that is the activation of dormant sensors that the device actually shipped with since its release. And these sensors pretty much just mirror the same thing that we saw announced last week uh, with the latest HomePod, which gives you the ability to see and read the temperature and humidity in the room that it's placed in. So... I really thought that was pretty cool that they gave that ability to kind of retrofit the old model, even though it's really not that old. Uh, The funny thing was, is I kind of found interesting that they didn't kind of bring it up when it first released. So I'm guessing there might have been a software thing going on. Yeah, so when I heard that from Marquez, um, he was talking about on his Way Informed podcast, and he mentioned that was actually in the mini, and I completely forgot to mention last week's episode, so I apologize for that. But um, I, I questioned, like, why in the... I had the same question as you, JD. I was like, why didn't they just put that in the mini 
and just they kept it in there as a as a thing that just existed, but it was never able to be utilized. And now it's right. it's on the HomePod, which is great, but like I, it's weird to me why they did that. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting because you kind of see that in the launch event, or I guess the press release event, technically, um, for the actual HomePod itself. And you're like, oh, wow, this is a really cool selling point. I like the fact that this has this feature, even though it's not like, you know, drop dead. Oh my goodness! Oh yeah, it's nothing major. They have this HomePod. I want to buy it now. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but now that they're actually kind of you know retrofitting that to the other one uh, with an update, it kind of makes it even less appealing in some ways. I guess. Yeah. And, I, I mean, obviously, a lot of it, I mean, you don't really buy a speaker just for temperature rating. Right. You know, it's more about the sound. Exactly. But it's just one less feature that you can say, oh, this is worth you know upgrading to when it's really not technically an upgradable feature. You have it on your mini. So. Right. A lot of added features that, like I said last week, um, they're good to have um, to use it your in your home. So, um, but yeah, it, it is mainly about the speaker side. I definitely agree with you on that. Um, so yeah, we actually come on to the uh, next thing, which is. Uh, some news from Android Authority. As you guys may know, Nothing Phone 1 came out last year with its founder, Carl Pei, trying to introduce something different than what you and I normally see in phones nowadays. However, it kind of flopped. Uh, People like JD and I were saying that while the LED features introduced uh, were pretty cool, the phone itself was a bit similar to the iPhone 12. Um, not to yeah. mention this phone did not launch in the U.S., which upset quite a few people since a lot of them oh, yeah. did want it. Um, but now we have some information um, that the next gen, the Nothing Phone 2, will undoubtedly be launched in the U.S. Um, and this article also mentions that Carl is stating that the phone would be more premium, which would make it more of a mid-ranged phone. Um, so something hmm. like that of maybe the Pixel 4a, the iPhone SE 2, something along those lines. Um, <laughs> while we don't know a whole lot of info regarding the specs, um, the author of this article, um, C. Scott Brown, suggests that the glyph, the LED functions in the back of the phone, um, mm-hmm. would be more power efficient and even brighter than before, which kind of combining those two things seems a little bit inter, um, contradictory, count- counterintuitive. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, but that's all we have for Nothing Phone. I don't know if you have any regards about that, but... Uh, I guess the only thing I question I had on that is it actually say um, what carriers it might be compatible with. While Pay didn't 100% confirm a U.S. launch for the phone too, he did say that is the company's number one priority. We know that he has been in talks with the U.S. carriers. We also know that the phone one was a temporary beta program, program for U.S. based buyers. So kind of a little bit of an edit there. It's not 100% confirmed that it's going to be U.S., but most likely it will be. Uh, just because yeah. Pay is trying to. Well, he that. said that he was like, if you want nothing phone one in the U.S., you need to start like you know bringing that to your carriers and stuff like yeah. that, and voice it out that you right. want this phone in this country. So, yeah, so that'll, he is be, that'll be really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I think um, this is nothing about his personality or anything outside of that. I, I think his approach, I've always appreciated, even when he was at One Plus. So, yeah, absolutely. The fact that he tr- still has that same drive um, is definitely encouraging just because he's able to not only just leave that company, but start up something again. Oh, for sure. And uh, try to have that same successful um, result. But yeah, really, outside of that, that's really all I have to had, had on that. Okay. Just the, just the question of you know carriers, because that's one of the things I'm curious about. Mm-hmm. Um, something of an intrigue that came across my feed this week, uh, and I'm kind of curious how you would interpret this. Uh, so let me just say this as a preface. Um, on the surface, it may not seem like much, and maybe there isn't a whole lot to worry about, uh, but there could be a cause for concern if this policy becomes more strict. Uh, in a report over at Notebook Check, Google plans on requiring their developers to update to the latest requirements for as new of a version of Android as possible via the latest API. And what I mean by that is they're trying to make sure that all the apps are updated so that way you can um, be on the latest version of Android. Okay. And the and if you're not, then your app will just be dropped. Right? Wow. Or you know, it just it won't show up on the Play Store. Okay. Uh, and, and this is said to just take place for better compatibility among newer phones. However, um, it kind of this was the one of the negative remarks that I had. I'm not sure how you take this. It could result in a bad experience if Google ties a shorter leash, ties to a shorter leash on how far back an OS version remains compatible. That is true. With the latest API. So if you only make it for like maybe two or three versions 
I don't know. And that then that would cause a concern because it would force users, if they have like a really favorite app or something like that, and like, oh, I can't get this, to upgrade to a new phone. I don't necessarily think Google would do that because they have a really good longevity as far right. as, you know, trying to make sure that people aren't like constantly upgrading. I feel like they do pretty good because I think they're doing, they're on three-year marks right now for their Pixel line, I think, three-year up, uh, OS upgrades. Mm-hmm. And then I think it's five year security updates if I'm not sure if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Um, I do think it it will cause an upset if this does happen, if this does take place. Um, I, I mean, yeah, at face value, it doesn't sound like a major issue because you do want your apps to be updated with the newest iOS. Oh yeah, that was like kind of obvious to me. Yes, yep. but yep, it's this whole. Um, question of how strict could it become well i was actually going to say this whole um ps5 xbox one paradox thing where you know they enforce something for um uh call of duty remember that where they they forced them to take this position um for nine years of like we'll allow you to use uh uh, cod and then that that license may break it's this whole limitation thing it's forcing some somebody on their own account to do something that may not be profitable for them at the time. Cause sure we could yep. say all these companies or all these app producers should do it, but maybe there's one um, developer that's like, eh, it's not right for me right now. Um, or even if it's just one that, you know, maybe hasn't, you know, gotten back to that app for a while yeah. to actually update it. Cause it happens oh, yeah, sure, that too. and you're like, the app still works perfectly fine. It's just they haven't updated to the latest APIs and stuff like that. So that's just something that kind of like, I was just kind of thinking that not really in the sense for me or other tech enthusiasts. It's more of like the average people like our parents. Yes. Who just have the basic apps and stuff like that. And so obviously you would hope that developers are, you know, up to date on this stuff. But it's just something to kind of keep an eye on, you know, the horizon with uh, some of these updates and developer requirements. So. Yeah, and the other thing as well is I know quite a few people, my wife included, who don't normally think about updating their phone. Um, it's just not on their bucket list, maybe because it adds too much storage or they're comfortable with the update right now. You know what I'm talking about? You mean OS upgrades? Yeah. Oh, oh. sorry. Oh, no, that's a really, that's a, I never even thought about that. Yeah, because I, like I said, I know a lot of people who just don't like to update just because they're comfortable with it right now. The battery life's yep. fine. Um, you know, I know people like, for example, windows, like people upgraded from eight to 10 had major CPU issues or performance issues. And they were very hesitant, very skeptical upgrading to that. So there's that issue too, that you have to worry about with trying to enforce this. Yeah. I mean, what happens when you get into an OS that has like a feature or something or had known issue that you don't like, like you said, I think it's even more prominent with uh, windows eight. Yeah from seven people hated that and they just didn't want to upgrade absolutely so, yeah it's something to look out for so um i'm sure we're sure we'll we'll uh see how that plays out in the end but um yeah um but on to some uh, other news here this is uh, um regarding regarding google uh and this is about their uh, redesign <laughs> you're really uh now just to be quite frank this <laughs> isn't a major change there's no like completely new fleshed out engine or anything like that. Yeah, I didn't think I saw no. that. No, so these are yep. just more of like refining tabs, rounding out text boxes. Um, yeah, that's and like, that's why I saw changing it. colors from like light gray to a little more of a light blue. Just some basic things, <laughs> just to change it to give it a more modern style. Um, I don't have a problem with this. I don't. I don't think most people would. Um, but when I when I did see the article, you never know. We we had that whole entire YouTube thing with it with the update and the, oh yeah, uh, I can't remember what it's called. Yeah, yeah. oh for and people sure, didn't like it. So it, who knows. But um, yeah, when I read that article, uh, I immediately thought, oh, they're going to change it like completely. Like, this is groundbreaking news. Um, and oh. honestly, it would be great to see that just because we've kind of had a similar style with Google, with, with Chrome for a while now. It's not needed, but it would be kind of cool to see maybe some new toggle features, some new maybe movements of certain um, tabs or something like that. Again, not necessary, but I thought it was cool to at least see these changes, so... Yeah, I, I think I see what you're saying. Like stuff that's more integrated yes. with social media, oh, absolutely. something that, you know, can link YouTube or some controls or whatever. I don't really, it's just more general, you know, shooting sure. off at the mouth yeah. here. But, you know, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I don't know what that would do because I know you don't technically agree with this, but it Chrome, in my opinion, has always been a resource hog. So 
Uh, I actually if do they agree, could yeah. actually make a way to update. You do okay if they would make a way to update the actual user interface while reducing the amount of resources it takes to yeah, run the uh, program. Then I think that would be absolutely phenomenal. For sure. Maybe this redesign will help with that. I'm not really sure. We really haven't got any confirmation on that because, yeah, it's all really been all about the appearance. So, mm-hmm. um, we will actually move on to Apple though, and uh, I think these next two topics, if I'm not mistaken, are going to hit the chipset category. Yeah. Um, per an article on Mac Rumors, the new M2, uh, not the M2 Pro Mac Mini, uh, that's configured with the 256 gigabit SSD, actually sees speeds reduced from anywhere between 30 to 50 percent on the read writes. Uh, yeah, I saw that from article. the previous M1 model. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Uh, that was pretty interesting. We were actually. <laughs> Riley and I were we were actually editing last week's episode and this popped up on my phone and it popped up on the computer screen that he was rendering on and we looked at this we were like oh well that's interesting um, <laughs> like this with that said sorry guys go ahead. Uh, like when we saw the whole Mac Mini at first there was just this climax of like oh my gosh this thing's amazing and then we realized it only had three ports or two ports on the Mac Mini just the M2. And then now we're seeing, okay, it's like even slower. So like, I feel like Apple made this grand yeah. thing and now it's just like, eh. <laughs> and honestly, I think it's just, it's, it's just a way for uh, users like you and I to be compelled to upgrade to the 512. Yeah. Which Apple's always done that money. kind of thing. And it's it's the whole entire tier level that we've kind of seen. It's, it it goes back to what Marquez said on that uh, talk show of just yes. the level and kind of working the working the user up to spending more and more money. Um, but uh, with that said, we actually did see this take effect with the latest MacBook Pros configured with the 512 SSD as well. Um, any other higher configurations are not affected and should perform similar, if not better, Good. than the prior M1 series models. So this was just something we wanted to bring forth to any listeners out there who are considering buying the Mac Mini. Just know that if you do get a 256 SSD, you may see you know reduction in transfer for read and write speeds. Mm-hmm. Um, but outside of that, I don't really think there's anything majorly scary about that. No unless you're actually a high-performance user. so Absolutely, yeah. And actually, speaking of uh, chipsets, uh, Ming-Chi Kuo went to Twitter to state that Apple will release the M3 chipsets for the next line of MacBook Pros next year. Um, now, he doesn't give a whole lot of specs. However, I'm going to do my best to give what I think would be the next benchmark scores. Uh, so far, with each next-gen processor, the speeds are about 20 to 25% faster than its predecessor. I checked and verified okay. the Geekbench scores over on Mac Rumors, and what I found is that the M3 Max could have a benchmark of 108,000 to 115,000, which in turn would, mathematically speaking, have a single core score of at most 2,461 and a multi core score of 18,878 um, for the Max. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was expecting the yeah. M3 next year, and with my speculation, this should be the standard set. At least that's what I'm assuming, because you see the trend that Apple makes um, across their yeah. chipsets, and that is my hope and my expectation. So I don't know how you how you felt about you know that in a sense, but at least the news is there. Uh, not really. I mean, um, you actually kind of caught me off guard there because I really don't think about benchmark scores. I think that's a way for me to see how well a chip has improved from a previous generation or comparison to a competitor. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, it doesn't necessarily make me think, oh, this is a reason to buy, you know, set Oh, product. no, not at all. Um, and you agree with that, obviously. Yeah. And uh, but it's it's interesting to speculate, OK, how much more performance can this next gen have? Um, yeah. So I really couldn't say anything on that just because I really don't have anything to go off of. Obviously, you've done your you know homework and looked at the past and kind of see what we could possibly see. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I think in the I think in the end, it's it's just going to be one of those. This is just another impressive step by step. Yeah, absolutely. Process that Apple is making. So. I'm I'm honestly at this point in time I'm excited to see how much further they can go. Yeah. Um and I've been impressed so far. Obviously these stupid little, you know, reductions in speed and ways to make people buy the higher it's annoying. tier. That's typical Apple and it's annoying, yes. Yeah, for sure. I don't agree with it at all. That's just the way it is. 
Um, but as far as what they're trying to do to compete with the market, um, it's it's phenomenal. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. And the actual reason why I actually, um, kind of brought that up was mainly because that's the um, extrapolated uh, data that is the standard for next year. What I would like to see Apple go far beyond that, kind of like how they did with the Mac One Mini, or excuse me, the Mac Mini this year. Although, yeah, we have some issues yeah. with that, but um, but that data taken from all across the last couple of years, if they go beyond that, that means that they are working and pushing even harder than they have been. So um, that's kind of why I brought those those numbers up, um, just to kind of see how that would look, and maybe even further beyond than that. The one thing that I'll say in closing out this topic here is that I have this this mental itch of knowing that we may not see possibly ever an M series extreme. And I really want to see an extreme. I want to see what that bad boy can do. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So yes, after Ultra, you've had, you had the Pro, you had the Max, you had the Ultra. Ultra and the they, they said that the Extreme is going to be canceled and it's not going to be part of the Mac Pro, which is yet again another reason not to get that model. Um, but that's just something that I'm like, oh, I wish they would do it. <laughs> yeah. But it's just how far of, can you go at this uh, time of period? Mysteries, I guess. What was that? I said, how mean? I mean, how far can you go at this time period of technology? I mean, it's. <laughs> Evidently, they could go farther, yeah. So anyway, we'll move on to this week's deals, and um, they are actually all about uh, TVs, as some of you may be getting ready for the big game in two weeks, and there are definitely some corresponding discounts available. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll go ahead and start off with a Sony Bravia XR A80J Series 55-inch 4K. So that was originally $1,900. It's down to $900, so $1,000 discount on that Dang. one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then I've got one from Amazon here. It's the TCL 50 inch uh, 4K Roku TV. Um, 52% off. So it went from 500 to 240. So it's a little bit on the lower end, but it's still yeah. a fairly good uh, standard in today's. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that one. Yeah, we want to try to give you guys a broad range because we know that not everyone has the same you know budget or yeah, plan or anything absolutely. like that. So, uh, but this next one. Uh, is the Samsung QN900B. It's a Neo QLED 85-inch 8K. Whew, mouthful. Yeah, this bad boy is not for the faint of heart. Uh, at seven grand, it's discounted down to five grand. Whoa. Do you guys have like a big wad of change burning a hole in your pocket? Then this this could be one to <laughs> uh, to spend it on if you're a Samsung fan, I guess at least. So yeah, that's insane. <laughs> Goodness gracious, $5,000. <laughs> All right. Well, on to another low end. <laughs> I think I've got the low ends. You've got the high end ones. Um, I did have a budget this one. This is so, the yeah, uh, Amazon that. Fire TV 50 inch. Uh, it's 32% off, so it go. It went from 469 to 319 um, I've actually never used... I've used the uh, the Fire Stick, but I've never used a, um, a Fire TV in general, but I assume it works the same way. But Yeah, it probably does. It's just integrated software. So. Yeah. So that's that one. Um, and then the last two we had real quick was an LG 83 class mini LED. This is a 65 inch 4K. Uh, it was 1700 now it's down to a grand. And then, like I said, if you guys are on a tighter budget, we do have a Hisense 65 inch U6H 4K Google TV uh, down from 800 to 500. So. We may have others in the description that we won't get into on the show, but definitely check them out if you're looking to get a big screen for the big game or just want to take advantage of some Super Bowl deals. So, Yeah, absolutely. We'll get back into some of the hot topics to close out the show. And first we'll go to Google. And there is a feature rollout that's surfacing for Gmail users. You might find this one interesting, actually. Hmm. Uh, this feature was originally announced this past November for from the Alphabet subsidiary. And the feature entails Gmail having the capability of screening emails for shipping tracking numbers, then sending them to all major shipping carriers, and in turn, updating you on shipping updates for your packages. Wow. That's pretty dang efficient. I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, Google already sees 90% of the stuff that we have all of yeah, personal data, true. so this isn't really much of a shock. They're just actually using it to better help with the user experience. For sure. Um, so there are a couple things to note. Um, 
one of which I already mentioned, and that this is rolling out gradually, so you may not see it right away. Uh, I actually have seen it on my phone. So the next thing I want to point out, of course, is how to enroll in this feature. Um, in the Gmail app, you'll have to tap the three level lines on the top left to access the side menu. Then you'll scroll to the bottom and tap settings. And then select you know whichever Gmail account you want to enable this on. And then as you scroll down, it'll be in the general section and you'll see an option to tick that says package tracking. And that's it. You just tap Simple. it, enable it, and you're enrolled. So, which brings me to the my final items to note, and that is I have not seen this feature on iOS on the iOS side of things. Huh. It is only on Android Gmail. That's what I've noticed. I checked both of mine, I made sure my Gmail was updated and it's just one of those things. So, and so far, this has not been visible on any G Suite accounts. So, if you do have a G Suite account, then there is a good chance you may not see it. Uh, I actually have a G Suite G Suite account through my the company I work for, mm-hmm. and I did look for it, and it was not available. Okay, uh, at least yet. Um, even though I did see it on my personal account, so I've actually tested this out. It is available um, from personal experience, so it's pretty cool. I actually haven't fully tested it out with you know any packages that are coming sure. um, but I don't know I, I thought it was pretty interesting I don't know if you had anything else to say on it that I mean it's nothing like major like, like you know advancement yeah. or anything like that but um, yeah. I guess when the iOS version comes out I'll definitely have to try that out and uh, see how well it uh, works and everything like that so Riley is not well cultured what do you mean y- you only have an iPhone <laughs> Well, I only have a phone, so let's get that straightened out first. Okay. One phone is all you need, people. All right. Unless you're JD. So, um, so yeah, that's actually pretty cool. I'll have to, I'll have to see that on iOS, uh, how well that works. But that's uh, a great yep. feature for sure. Um, and next one on our list is from Mac Rumors, and they have some interesting news regarding Apple launching a foldable iPad with carbon fiber kickstands. Um, this also this is also supported by Ming-Chi Kuo, stating to be released somewhere next year. Um, it has also been mentioned that Apple is allegedly working with LG to create an ultra-thin glass. Assumably, this would kind of be similar to that of like the uh, the Fold or the Flip from Samsung, uh, kind of similar style. I don't know how LG has progressed um, with that, or even if this is actually uh, fully a thing where Apple is working with LG, but at least that's what this yeah. article notes. Um, my an- another assumption I have is that this w- this may carry the M3 chip, um, not the Pro or the Max, but just the base M3. Um, since it is a major flagship, I believe that they may in turn it is a premium model. They may yeah. in turn put it this in there. Be. So, um, yeah, yeah. I agree. So, yeah, that's what we've got there, um, which is pretty amazing. We've already um, known Apple is going to bring out their flip or fold in the next few years. So, for them already to do this right here is it's a lot to say for them. So, um, I wonder if it'll be MagSafe compatible. I bet you it might I be. If there's a magnet yeah. outlining that kickstand. It could. That's, that's, oh, I've seen it. It's, it's something we've seen kind of with cases as well. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if Apple even thought about doing that. So, But it is foldable, so we'll kind of see how that integrates. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, that's one model that I'm definitely excited about. Uh, even if it's just an iPad, I'm yeah. excited to see what Apple oh, can for do sure. in the foldable market. So. With that said, we are about to close this one out. And we're roughly a week away from the OnePlus event. And actually, on a quick side note, we're actually two days away from the Samsung Galaxy Unpacked event, and I'm just as excited about that one as the OnePlus event, Mm -hmm. um, because we are expected to see the OnePlus 11 and the next-gen OnePlus Buds Pro. However, there is an unexpected model to their lineup that we're sure to see. Uh, According to their latest refresh website, OnePlus has partially unveiled the model they have labeled as the OnePlus Pad. Okay. Not much else is really known about this tablet. What kind of chip is powering it? How large the screen will be? Or, as is often the most important question with most OnePlus models, if this tablet will see sales here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we will find out here soon as their event is set to take place next Tuesday, the 7th at 9 a.m. Eastern. So That wasn't expected. (laughs) That yeah, I mean, I I kind of felt like they might do that as far as getting a tablet into the market. Um, 
But it's hard to say because OnePlus has been kind of iffy lately as far Finicky, as what they're trying yeah. to do and their model names and stuff like sure. that. Yeah, so. Um, but I don't know as though I'm excited about this. I'm excited because it's going to add more competition possibly. But Maybe, yeah. I don't know if it's actually one that I'll buy just because I, I would either go for probably a Samsung tab or, you know, iPad. So Well, I'd probably still buy to try it out and test and see if it's, you know, or, or you know, like, you know, check do, out yes. what YouTubers are saying about it. Like, you know, if they think it's a good deal, if they think that it's the processing and everything there is worth it. Um, but yeah, we'll have to see how that works. Out. Yeah, that's something that we will have to see because we don't know anything yeah, about this. Right. So, um, OnePlus has actually been pretty good as far as the performance on some of the specs because mm-hmm. they tend to pack it with a good, decent amount of RAM. Yeah, that's true. Um, but we have no idea. We don't even know if this is going to be like a budget model. So it's really hard to say at this point in time. Um, but we're we're uh, really close to it anyway, so there's not much to worry about speculating on. Mm. Yeah, well, with that, with that, I've got um, one last thing here today. And uh, we haven't done this for quite a few months, but we're going to do a sort of like a tech shout out. And this one um, really caught my eye today, and it's called Oh Snap. Uh, they make pop sockets that utilize the exact same capability as MagSafe, and to quote them, Apple calls us heretics. We just want everyone to have access to the cool tech. Got an Android, Pixel, etc., and secretly wish it ha- was MagSafe? Done. MagSafe for all. End quote. They had the same features of a normal pop socket, secure grip, kickstand and since it is magnetic you can place it on something like a fridge and watch our podcast while you're cooking dinner or whatever um they call them snap pros but that is not all they are 2.5 millimeters just as for reference a nickel is two millimeters um and most pop sockets are six so this cuts down the size by 66 percent. so that way when you put it back in your pocket you're not it's not grabbing it at all um, they are stationed in our beautiful state of North Carolina, and right now you can get 15% off your order. They cost 30 bucks a piece, but with that discount, you can get them for $25. Uh, they come in six awesome colors, and they also have the snap stand, um, which also has another version, the wireless charging stand. The uh, snap car, again, there's a wireless charger for that too, and uh, just a basic wireless charger. They have car adapters, power adapters, ring kits, and even gift cards. So, you know, if you want to give these to your friends to, you know, get them to buy something, uh, maybe they've been looking for one, you can give that to them as well. So, I mean, I'm considering buying one because, like, for the last six months, whenever I go into Walmart, I'm always looking at pop sockets because I really like um, their capabilities and utilizing them. Um, but I never can find a good quality one. But I think this one definitely um, hits home for sure. So... Yeah, I mean, I, I always thought that it was kind of cool to be able to do the same thing on an Android, kind of give it that magnetic capability. Um, and obviously, yeah. we'll see that with uh, Qi 2, the right. generation of wireless charging here in the fall or winter time. And uh, But I mean, it's cool that they give you that, that ability to kind of make previous models that don't have, you know, Qi 2 exactly. magnetic yeah. um, or magnetically compatible. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool. I, I like that. Um, I've never even heard of that company, but, uh, evidently they seem like they're well-grounded and have a good, uh, following. Yeah. They've raised over $1.5 million for this whole thing. And it's, it's astounding how far they've come. Is this another Kickstarter company? Actually, it's not. Um, no. Oh, okay. It says the, um, today we successfully launched several crowdfunding campaigns, it, they, they don't specify what it was, but uh, the most recent of which raised $1.75 million from 27,000 awesome backers. Uh, we met our funding goal in 30 minutes and finished as <laughs> one of the most backed phone accessory campaigns of all time. So, wow. yeah, I'm, I'm getting one. You can even do bundles, so I'm, I might get one for you as well because they're, they're really cool. Wow. So, yeah. All that said, we do hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Feel free to like, subscribe, share, as well as comment down below if you're listening on YouTube. Uh, we did have quite a bit going on this week, so yeah. I'm sure there's got to be something that you kind of have your opinion on. Um, you can also catch us on Twitter, Facebook, and we'll definitely be back next week for more news and updates. This is JD and Riley signing off. Peace out. Peace out.